Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome, online students. Thank you for joining class. Uh, welcome to our in-person students. Uh, and also welcome to our uh, e-learning students who will be listening to this lecture later on. Thank you all for uh, joining class this morning. Um, we'll begin before um, uh, we begin. Can some one of you please lead us in prayer, please? Anyone? Can anyone lead us in prayer, please? Online students, anyone can unmute your mics and lead us in prayer, please? Yeah, I'll, I'll pray. Thank you, Sam. Yeah, uh, Father, we just thank you for this morning. Thank you for this time. Uh, we just ask for your presence, your wisdom. Um, and uh, we pray, Lord, that as we look to your word, that you will reveal yourself and we will grow deeper in you. We thank you once again. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Um, so we were actually going to have uh, our students teach on the uh, portions in um, uh, from where I stopped last time, right? The timeline, Reformation, Revivals, Restoration, and Missions. Um, and I think I had posted it pretty late on Friday. I, I, I think you all have, wouldn't have got the time to prepare and most of you would have been very anxious. So I thought, uh, let's not trouble all of you <laughs> to present today and give you all a hard time. Uh, so I just decided that we'll um, have it um, next week. Okay. Uh, so next week, uh, we'll have uh, Abhishek Sagar, Andrew Munro, Angeline Mercy, Arista Moses, Biju Achan Kuti, Daniel Oliver, Asapu Raj, Vimal Diksha, uh, Deepu, and uh, yeah, Deepu, till, till Deepu. Okay. So all of you would uh, be sharing uh, next week. Is that fine with all of you? Yes. Okay. Uh, so if you look at the the details I sent in the uh, for the assessment. Okay, I've also mentioned the date and the page numbers. Okay, so just in case you get confused, I've also mentioned. Uh, if you look at the uh, the stream page, the classroom page, the details are given. So kindly just have a look there, and uh, you will notice that I have. Uh, Mention the the date and the page numbers. Are you all having a look at it now? Yes. Okay. So uh, so next week, uh, all of you who I had called out now, please be ready. And then uh, on the twenty second, we have uh, Divya Darshini, Kofi, Komal, uh, John Blessy, uh, Miriam. Sugat and uh, Rupus, Moses, Prem, and uh, Shaker. Okay, so all of you will be presenting on 22nd. 29th, uh, we have uh, Sam Matthews, Esther Clement, Lucy, um, Warren James, and Alfred. Okay, I hope I did not miss out anybody. My name, sister. I didn't. Uh... I think I'm 29. Yes, get through. Yes, on 22nd. Oh, you're on 29th. Sorry. Yes. Yeah, you're okay. on 29th. All the editing has. Uh... Sorry? Yeah, two missionaries. And some, for some of you, where it is very, very short. The passages I have given you, um, yeah, I've given you more than uh, two, just depending on the content. And some of you, I've also given you, uh, if you look at page number, um, yeah, 
Yeah, if you look at page number 51 and top of page number 52, uh, the forerunners of the he uh, healing revival, page number, I don't know if the same, it's, it's the same for you. 51? 51 and 52? Yeah, okay, oh, this is the same uh, edition, yeah. Okay, so now forerunners of healing revival, okay. Um, there you have page number 51 and page number 52, where just the list of um, uh, people like John Alexander, Maria Woodworth, Smith Wigglesworth, uh, Lillian, John G. Lake, uh, Fred, and um, Amy are mentioned, but not much of the details are given about these people. So for those of you who have them, I've just kind of given you one, uh, you know, uh, revivalist or reformer from the course content. And also I have given you one of these uh, healing uh, revivalists. So you will have to read up, you will have to make a little notes so you can present it during that time. It's okay, because here there's only one or two lines just mentioned about these healing revivalists, but you all will have to spend some more time in uh, preparing and mentioning about that. So I think um, the people who have to do that is um, Biju. You have Mary. I don't know. I don't think it's Mary Selser is here. No, it's not Biju, but I think it is um, Vimal, Diksha, Deepu. Divya and uh, Komal, John Blessy, yeah, and Moses. The others uh, don't have to do any extra reading and work. But of course, if you want to present this in a nice way, you can read up about these people who have been given uh, in the course content and also you can uh, present it. So you all will come and sit here, each one of you. And you will teach. It's a, it'll be a good time uh, for all the um, online students to see our in-person students finally after, you know, almost so many months of you all being part of the same course and the same class. And it will also be very exciting for me to, uh, you know, see all our in-person students. I don't get to see any of you, your faces, we'll get to see you, hear your voices as well. So it'll be a good time of interaction, that is what I'm more looking at. And also uh, just hearing uh, you all and it will be a good experience for you all as well. Yes, Koman. Sorry? Yes, yes, you can uh, see your notes, you can have everything, whatever you want. You don't have to make any presentation because that will be a little stressful if you're not able to move it forward or get it up on the screen. I don't want to stress you all. But you all can bring your notes. You don't have to speak from, uh, you know, uh, from your mind, you know, or you just have to learn it up. No, you can use your notes. Just feel free. I'm looking more at the content. I understand some of you are not too great at English. I'm not going to look at that. But how you content, your presentation, what are the learnings that we can receive from and what did you learn as well. It's all very detailly mentioned. If you can read through uh, what I have written, everything is very clear there. Yes. Please take the mic so our online students can also hear you. If I had to speak about Maria Woodworth, hmm. so can I research from other resources also or I have to just look at content? Yes, Maria, Maria Woodworth is actually here. It has just given two lines. Right, so you will have to, you know, uh, go up uh, the, uh, the net and search, and you can also uh, find uh, a detailed life history about her in uh, that book, uh, God's Generals. So, what specific we have to focus like? So here is basically talking about her as a healing revivalist. So just focus on that. You don't have to talk about her whole life and ministry. How? she what she did as a healing revivalist how god used her mightily and what was you know her part that she played and what we can learn right okay anyone else has any doubts online students any doubts sister it has to be five minutes or seven minutes the uh, uh, sermon uh, uh, your sharing can be on, uh, your teaching can be uh, five, uh, I can give you till right up till seven minutes. But even if you extend a little more, 
two minutes, I can give you more grace time. Ten minutes, <laughs> right? Oh, okay, yeah. sister. Yeah. Okay, uh, if there are no questions, what we are going to do is, since we are not going to begin uh, presenting uh, about these reformers, revivalists, and um, uh, missionaries and healing uh, uh, evangelists today, I'm going to move on to, you know, um, to chapter four, okay? It's uh, just a brief uh, note over there about reformers and reformation. And then also, since I have uh, assigned chapter five to um, some of you, I'm also going to uh, move on from chapter five and move on to chapter uh, six. Okay. So we'll try to co cover as much content in chapter four and chapter six. And then we'll continue with uh, chapter three um, next week. And then, you know, I'll uh, likewise just follow up with you all. Okay. Is that fine? Yes. Okay. So we look at chapter four today, uh, reformers and reformation. Okay. So even as we've been looking at chapter three, we've been looking at a lot of people who were, uh, God, who were missionaries, but also those who were reformers who brought about reformation and how because of their uh, reformation, these reformers, you know, brought about revival. Okay. So we are just going to understand how reformation, how these reformers, reformation have a role to play in revival. Okay. So what is um, reformation? In general, reformation is basically an act or it's a process of improving something or, you know, uh, it is also some, it is also improving or correcting the faults or problems that are there. So we see uh, various reformers. Can you name some of them which whom we learned reformers? Martin Luther, okay. John Wesley, yes. Ida Scudder, okay. John Calvin, yes. John Huss, John Wycliffe, okay. So all of these were um, reformers. And we see that, you know, reform, uh, reform, reformation is basically an act or a process where you improve something. So what did these reformers improve? We named John Wycliffe, John Husk, John Calvin, uh, Martin Luther. What did they reform? They reformed the wrong doctrine that was taught in the church, the Bible. Yes, yes the doctrines and also the truths right the scriptural truths and uh, the you know how the church needs to function and work how it's not doing what it is supposed to do as given in the scriptures okay so they were they uh, we also see many reformers who you know abolished slave trade yes yes and we also see um, uh, people like um, um, who came to uh, India, in Calcutta, I'm forgetting his name. Uh, William Carey, uh, we see William Carey also abolished, uh, helping in the abolishing of uh, Sati movement and other reformers as well. Okay, so uh, in many instances, these reformers they work towards reformation, and because of the reformation they bring in, you know, it made way for revival, like Martin Luther you know, uh, the Protestant Reformation that was there. You know, we see the Pentecostal Reformation that came, charismatic. All of these were brought about by these reformers who tried to reform things that were happening in the church and ultimately led to revival, okay? So we see that reformation paves the way to revival. So God can use you also to reform things that are happening in the church today. Uh, in the church in your specific geographical location. Also, if you know God is using you to bring about reformation of things that are happening in the church, in the doctrines, in society, and that can also lead to revival. Okay, so reformation uh, makes way for revival and it eventually leads to restoration. Okay, restoration of uh, truths, restoration of God's word, uh, restoration of um, 
the sacraments that are in the church, the right doctrines in the church, uh, the um, also the, the 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 way the church uh, you know functions, uh, the the restoration of the fivefold offices. All of these things can be restored, can be revived, and uh, basically is the birthing of moments within the church or the missionary moments that will reach out to the world okay so we looked at some notable reformers and we saw john cliff right we remember john cliff was called as the morning star of the reformation okay because he was he he had this great passion and this desire that the whole english the bible that was in hebrew greek and latin and in latin it was only accessible to the clergy to the priests that you know he felt that the scripture had to be also available to the common man and he translated it, uh, it in English and we know that he made it available to the common man to read so that they, they are able to know what the scripture talks about life, about doctrines, the truths and how the church has to function. Then remember we also learned about John Huss, yes. He felt a need to reform and bring about modifications in, ter in terms of eradicating the corruption that is there or the abuse that is there in the Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church. Okay, And we know Huss also, John Huss also believed that each person should have their Bible in their own language which they could read. Okay, Another reformist we saw was, and you named him, is Martin Luther. And Martin Luther posted this 95 Theses. 95 Theses means 95 things that were going wrong in the church or doctrinally wrong, which is not according to the scripture. He posted it on the uh, church door in Wittenberg in Germany in October 30, on October 31st, uh, 1517. And this led to a great reformation, the Protestant Reformation. Uh, John Calvin, okay, John Calvin, uh, 1536, he was a reformer in Switzerland. He was basically born in France. Uh, he was a very young man when he started out. He had a very brilliant mind. Uh, he was somebody who studied law, okay. And um, uh, I'm referring to John Calvin, who is mentioned in Chapter 3. He's not mentioned here in Chapter 4. But in Chapter 3, uh, John Calvin, you know, he... Um, uh, be, he began reading, he was a lawyer by profession, he studied law, he began reading Martin Luther and soon began, uh, became a leader of the Reformation in France, okay. So, in 1533, John Calvin had to run away to France. We don't know why he had to flee to France. And he spent the next three years as a fugitive. You know what's a fugitive? Somebody who's... Sorry? Uh, a runaway, you know, somebody who's running away from their own place to hide, to save their own lives. So he was a fugitive evangelist in France. And then he went on to settle in Geneva, which is in Switzerland. And he remained there for most part of his life till he died in 1564. Now in 1536, Calvin published the first edition of um, uh, one of his writings, which is called the Institutes of the Christian religion uh, in that he very clearly explains and he brings together uh, key beliefs of the reformation okay and at the age of 27 imagine just such a young age he had already produced systematic theology you all remember systematic theology did you all study systematic theology <laughs> yes no did you all study systematic theology we're studying now sister what now, we're studying is systematic theology, right? Uh, I thought you was you studied systematic theology, uh, Deepika. Yes, the subject systematic theology. Deepika taught you all in the ah doctrines. Is that yes. what is systematic theology? Yes. Well, uh, Deepika taught you all right in I think the second semester, first year. Yes. Okay, so he produced a major a book, uh, a work on systematic theology. That uh, systematic theology is basically all the doctrines, right? You studied all the doctrines in systematic theology, and uh, Deepika th Samuel taught you that. So he also brought about very clear um, uh, ideas about and teachings of the Reformation in that book, and. Um, 
In addition to that, he was also pastoring a church and he was preaching almost daily and he wrote uh, extensively, you know, um, and he produced dozens of uh, devotionals, doctrinal pamphlets so that people can just read some doctrines, not like a full book, but pamphlets, you know, booklets and commentaries he wrote on most of the books of the Bible, which is still available today. Okay. And he also carried out vast correspondence and trained many of them, uh, scores of them who went out as missionaries. Okay. So John Calvin was a very prominent figure in uh, Protestant Reformation. And he had such a significant influence on the city of Geneva. You know, actually, his whole um, goal was to transform this entire city. This entire city was actually, you know, had no Christian principles and moral ethics and values. Okay, it was a, it was in 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 a deep moral degradation, no morality, very low moral values, and it was his goal to transform Geneva into a model of the kingdom of God on the earth. Okay, so what he did was he brought out some, uh, uh, you know, uh, principles from God's word that governed moral standards and he gave it to the government and, uh, you know, uh, his uh, teachings and his uh, writings were so powerful that they actually started to change even his preaching. He was an evangelist, right? And he was also preaching. Uh, more, uh, every day he used to preach. So he used to preach basically about all of these moral standards, you know, how to live biblically, uh, you know, right, the moral standards given in God's word. And that started changing the very moral fa fa fabric of the city. Okay. And um, it was so influential that the city council, you know, the the the, the the city council that takes care of uh, the the governmental uh, you know jurisdiction of the city you know they um, they brought out a confession of faith based on all his writings and you know the the moral codes the standards that he brought out from the bible and uh, you know every citizen of geneva was required to agree and to live by that confession that was written by John Calvin. Can you see how powerfully just one reformer, one man was not only able to bring about um, reformation in the church, but also in the society. So you and I can also do that because, you know, God is still working in and through us. He's calling us. He's raising us up. And if you are just available, he can use us like he used these uh, great reformers and evangelists and missionaries. So uh, this confession of faith, these moral standards that he had written for, uh, you know, the change in the, in the whole city, the council took it and they gave it to each and every citizen and they told each and every citizen that, hey, you have to agree to these things and you have to live by this confession. So now the, what became the laws of the land? The laws of the land became the laws that were in the Bible. Is it possible? Yes, it, it happened. So it's even possible today. And over time, you know, Geneva became a center of moral and spiritual renewal. Imagine a city that was in moral degradation, so morally declined and bad and, you know, down. Um, the way they just, you know, just because of the biblical principles that people followed, adhered to, uh, we see that the whole city, there was a moral and spiritual uh, renewal. And this attracted uh, many Protestants from across Europe. And they came to Geneva, came to Switzerland, just for guidance uh, in this reformation and how to have a God-centered society. So we see in, in just in short, Calvin transformed Geneva, you know, from a morally corrupt city uh, into a, a, a city where, you know, godly values, the truth in God's word became their values, their standard. And it not only influenced the city, but also the, you know, the cities beyond. Um, and it brought about a, a reformation in other cities as well. Okay. So the other people that uh, we looked at was John Knox and uh, George Fox, okay? So all of these were reformers. Now, what are the characteristics of these reformers? You can look at page number 63. Uh, what are the characteristics of these reformers? 
is basically they had they were very intimate in their relationship with god and because they were intimate in their relationship with god what flowed out of that intimacy revelation yes so if you want to know deeper truths in god's word what is the key for receiving a revelation intimacy with god deep intimacy with god the second thing uh, so we see that you know um, uh, reformers like martin luther john calvin zwingli and others had a very personal relationship with god they were not people who just simply uh, you know just accepted the religious teachings of their day but they sought to have a deeper understanding of what god had spoken in the scripture and thank god they did that because when they did that you know their eyes were opened to the truth and they were able to see the the wrong teachings the wrong culture the wrong governmental uh, uh, structure that was placed in the church for example uh, martin luther he studied the book of romans you know romans is a very powerful book anyone who reads the the book of romans they you know they can there is they know the gospel the gospel is very clearly uh, uh, written there and also how to live out that gospel um, uh, you know paul writes uh, uh, you know illustrates that very beautifully so somebody who reads the book of romans they can accept jesus because the truth about who god is the gospel of jesus christ Uh, the gospel of salvation uh, our identity our spiritual identity and how we can live up to the gospel is all very clearly spelled out in the book of romans yes uh, ma'am uh, not like saying difficult but uh, on a comparative scale when you look at new testament romans is something one it is in more depth but it is not so easy to grasp no on the surface when you just read compared to other epistles and gospels Yes, yes, it's a it's a, a deeply doctrinal uh, book, uh, but if you yeah, and the way he's written is uh, you know, and just a very uh, look at it and just reading it is you know very difficult to, for us to perceive and understand from where he's coming from, but if you really get a hold of it, it's uh, it's it's such a deep revelation that he brings out. and it's so powerful that you know the truths there that he spelled out there he's uh, uh, you know elaborated there is is exceptionally interesting and exciting and anyway you will learn that uh, next sem uh, the, the 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 last uh, yeah the first, the third year the first semester yes very interesting book so you know um, so he studied the book of romans and uh, martin luther and he received this revelation from romans chapter 1 verse 17 where it says the just shall live by faith okay so he realized and when he received this revelation that you know we are justified by faith and not by our actions okay so that became justification by faith became the core doctrine of the reformation why did it become the core doctrine of the reformation because you know there were so many rituals in the church remember i told you all of this purgatory and you know uh, this uh, you have to pay money and you were, your sins will be forgiven and all of those things that were happening in the church you know um, he realized that was all you know the wrong teaching and the wrong doctrines but the truth of the god's word is that we are justified by faith we are made right in the eyes of god not through our actions not through what we do but faith in jesus christ and what he's done for us on the cross okay so um so the for these reformations they reform ref, these uh, reformers the connection with god you know was not based on tradition or ritual but was something more deeper and personal with the bible okay so if god wants to use you then you need to also be somebody who is you know deeply intimately connected with his word and uh, in uh, in seeking him and having a relationship with him the second one uh, that we see characteristic is that they had the strength to stand alone right in the face of opposition even when they're facing overwhelming opposition both from the church and the political powers remember we were looking at the dark ages and after that how the church was governed or run by the by the the church was run and governed by whom sorry the pope and the pope was controlled by whom 
Who was the Pope? Where was the Pope getting all his orders from? Huh? No. Who is the, where was the Pope getting all his orders from? The king, right? The one who was ruling, remember? Right? Uh, remember when uh, those 6,000 books were produced? You know, what did that, uh, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the one who was ruling burnt everything, right? Uh, remember that? Yes? So we see that, you know, how the government and how the, um, uh, the, uh, the kings had a say in the church, okay? And that is why things were also not going right. It started from the time of Constantine. Right when Constantine, um, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, made the church like an institutionalized church, and everything that was happening in the church was, uh, you know, was uh, governed by the governing authorities politically, the kings and the uh, rulers. Okay, so uh, we see Martin Luther, you know, uh, when he was called uh, um, before the the council or the rulers in Worms, Worms is a city, okay, in 1521, and he was asked to withdraw and deny his teachings, right? But what did uh, uh, Martin Luther say? He said, here I stand, I can do no other, God help me, amen. That is what he said, okay? He says, "I here I stand, I can do no other, God help me. So he knew that when he is not going to, you know, denounce his teaching, deny his teaching, they are going to kill him, okay? So this is a kind of courage, and they stood alone to bring about the reformation, to defend the scriptures, to defend the truth and the doctrine. So men like John Calvin in Geneva, okay? William Tyndale, remember William Tyndale? You know, he, uh, uh, yes, published the Bible, wrote the Bible, and John Husk, Okay, we're all willing to stand firm on their beliefs and uh, even when they were persecuted and they were killed by the authorities. Okay, so many of them were imprisoned, excommunicated, executed, but they did not give up on their faith and their doctrines and what they stood by God's word. Okay, the third characteristic we see is they had the courage to speak the truth even when religious, social and political systems uh, seemed large and daunting, okay? So one of the defining characteristics of these reform reformers was they were very unwavering in their courage to speak against the corrupt religious practices and the doctrines in the church, okay? And these uh, reformers, they also uh, boldly challenged all of the abuses and the persecutions that they faced. Uh, we know John Wycliffe and later John Husk, you know, they were questioned um, uh, by the Pope. And, uh, you know, um, um, but they emphasized that the Bible had the supreme authority. It was not the Pope. It was not the clergy, but it was the Bible that had the supreme authority in the church and in the lives of the people. And when they did that, they put their lives at risk because they were going against the Pope and they were going against the government or the king or the ruler who was ruling over the church. Okay, So um, we also see that their courage was not just limited to theological debate, that is the right doctrine, what the scripture says, but also it uh, had to do with the social and political systems that were there. They also resisted some of these uh, things like uh, slave trade, you know, uh, slavery, uh, and other evils that were happening in the church and in the society. And then the fourth one is they were willing to lay their lives down for the truth. Okay, we know John Huss because of the truth that he stood up to, he was burned on the stakes, right? And um, because he stood up to the church corruption, he pointed out to the church corruption saying, hey, all that you're doing in the church is not what is given in the scripture. We also know William Tyndale translated the Bible in English so that the ordinary people could read it. And what happened? He was executed, right? He was killed. So the reformers believed that the truth of the gospel was, you know, actually worth more than their lives. They were willing to give up their lives. That's why we remember we said 
in the first chapter that if you want to bring about reformation, you want to bring about revival, there is a sacrifice that you have to make, right? A sacrifice that you have to make. So they stood for the purity of the scriptures and um, also that uh, the right of every individual, uh, uh, they had the right, they, they, um, they adhered to this thing that, you know, every individual had the right to understand God's word directly. And, um, you know, uh, they believed that the church was very, very corrupted and they spoke against it. The fifth one is using tools and platforms to proclaim their message, right? So what are some of the tools they used? The printing press. You remember the printing press that was invented by Johannes uh, Gutenberg? Yes, and how the Bibles were printed. We also know, I spoke about John Calvin, who wrote about systematic theology. He, uh, he wrote that Institute of the Christian Religion to teach and equip believers in the Reformed faith. And so many of these reformers, they wrote a lot of content, pamphlets, books, um, you know, dictionaries, uh, uh, translated the Bible into English and vernacular languages so that the ordinary people could have an access to the word of God. So these are some of the tools and platforms they used to proclaim the message. So here we are saying that, you know, church needs reformers like, they are, like what we have seen in church history. We also need reformers today, okay, who are unafraid, bold, strong, courageous, uh, to proclaim the truth, to challenge things that are not doctrinally right, scripturally right, going against some of the traditions and cultures in the church, which is not biblical, which is not according to God's will, and also helping people to remove the blinders, the things that are blinding their um, eyes, and things also that people have accepted as norm, right? Yeah, this is the way it is. But then we need to teach them that, hey, this is not the way it is because it's what God says about this, especially when it comes to the, uh, the um, especially when it comes to the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, uh, the move of the Spirit, the work of the Spirit, and also about healing and deliverance. Okay, very wrong ideas about all of this. Even the present the day church has. Um, which we need to teach and uh, correct so that we can, um, you know, usher the church into the next move of God. Usher the church to where God wants it to be. Okay. I'll stop here. This is chapter four. Anyone has any questions? Any questions? No questions? Yes. Please give him the mic. About the second one, I'm like, they had the strength to stand alone uh, when needed. What is the word when needed? It means if there is no need, they can't stand or so the trying to stand alone okay when needed it's like when needed the strength to stand alone when needed yeah uh, which was almost always yeah means yeah when needed means when they had to uh, they were challenged or they were confronted why are you writing this why are you speaking this why are you teaching this why did you post this uh, uh, thesis so like uh, I, I mentioned about uh, Martin Luther, he was brought before the government authorities and he was asked to deny all of his writings and teachings. And he, he, didn't, he stood, that time he had to stand alone, courageously, boldly, whether to, you know, uh, uh, denounce the truth and to give in to what the pressure that he's facing so that his life will be saved. But what he did was at that time, what was needed was he had to speak the truth. He stood up for the truth yeah any other questions sir do we have any <clears throat> present day reformers yes we do have uh, uh, many present day reformers we will be looking at that in um, in chapter 6 um, 
you know, we've had uh, many, um, like one of them can be, uh, you know, uh, Bill Johnson, uh, you know, we've also had people like um, Penny Hinn, Randy Clark, you know, uh, all of those people who are bringing about a reformation. Yes. Can you pass the mic? It's too much of a reformation good for the overall growth of a church, ma'am. Like, uh, we've seen centuries where at that time the opposition was different and uh, uh, things. So, no once the Bible is established and uh, uh, everything else is like done. But uh, ongoing, is it like good for overall for the growth of the church? So you're saying today, do we need reformers? Is it necessary? Kind of like, do, do, is it like, it's always transitional, no? So do you think reformers are necessary today? Yes, because there's so much of wrong teaching and wrong do doctrines that are uh, taught there. Especially, specifically about the gifts of the Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit, uh, the prophetic, the supernatural, um, grace, you know, the grace of God. Now we have the greater grace and all of those things. So we need... Uh, Stand against that, that I got it. But hmm. my, my whole uh, intent of asking this is like, will there be like too many denominations going further? Like, Oh, will there be too many denominations? Um, I don't think so. It will just... Uh, it will also bring about unity in, uh, uh, you know, because when God is raising up a reformer to reform things, to, you know, to change things and to bring align things to truth, then I'm sure he is also going to uh, use that to bring about unity and oneness uh, within the churches and also, uh, you know, uh, use that to, you know, enhance a greater faith, greater move of God. Uh, greater, uh, uh, you know, spiritual growth into deeper and greater levels, yes, than was before. Yeah. Yes, good questions. Anyone else? Okay, if not, we will move to chapter 6 because chapter 5 also uh, will be presented by some of you. Uh, then I will draw some conclusions out of uh, chapter 3 when you are finished chapter 3 and I also draw some conclusions out of chapter 5 when that is done. Okay, uh, but we'll just move on to chapter 6. Uh, is that okay? Yes? Yes, no. Can we have some answers, online students? Okay. Oh, thank you, Lucy. I thought you're not there in class today. I didn't see you. A little bit late, I was. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So uh, the restoration of the church. Okay. Can somebody uh, read Lamentations five twenty one, please? It's there in your uh, uh, publication page number seventy seven. Turn us back to you, O Lord, and we will be restored. Renew our days as of old. Amen. So we can pray this prayer as a church today. You know, turn us back to you, O Lord. And what happens when we turn back to the Lord? We will be restored, right? Whether as a community, a body of believers, as individuals, as families, it's time for us to now turn to the Lord so that we can be restored right there is a lot of restoration that needs to happen not only in the church but also in the family right the very moral fiber the fabric of family is also crumbling and you know um, uh, tearing down the divorce rates are very alarming compared to a few uh, years back few decades back you know uh, it's very sad uh, see how the younger generations is suffering because of uh, the decision of the parents, okay? <laughs> so uh, we are going to look at how, um, you know, to bring about restoration in the church, okay? Uh, so we saw that a reformation basically paves the way to revival, right? We said that, right? So we have God raises up people, reformers, they bring him about bring about the reformation that leads to a revival okay so and what happens when there is a revival what happens when there is a revival 
there's a restoration. Yes, all ours. Reformer, reformation, revival, and restoration. Okay, so um, restoration paves the way for revival, uh, which often results in the restoration of the church. Okay, so there are several areas where we can see this restoration. Uh, the first one is restoration in understanding the spiritual truths. Okay. So look at what Paul writes to the church at Ephesus. What is his prayer for them? Can somebody please read Ephesians chapter 4, verses 13 and 14, please? Till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men, in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. So here, you know, some of the verses in the Bible can be very powerful, meaningful prayers that we can pray, right? Like here we can take this prayer, this, this verse and, and speak it over our lives, speak it over our family, speak it over our, um, uh, you know, the life groups, the Bible study groups or the prayer groups that we are leading. Also, um, the churches that we, you know, we are leading or the organizations. So we can pray, God, help me, help my family, help my children. If you have children, you know, help uh, our church uh, or the fellowship group or the, you know, the, the group that you are an overseer. You no, know, uh, help us all, God, to grow in the knowledge that we will grow in spiritual wisdom and understanding and that we will all grow up to the full measure of the stature of Jesus Christ so that we can be that perfect man and so that we can all come to unity in the faith and knowledge in the son of God and that we will no longer be children who are tossed to and fro carried about by every wind of doctrine that we will not be easily carried away by every wrong teaching and doctrine but god i pray that each one of us will come to the full measure you know to the perfect man the stature the fullness of christ that we will be filled with all spiritual wisdom knowledge and understanding and all of this will help us to grow in the unity of the faith and you can also say god not just unity of the faith in our church but also in the body of Christ in our city and in our nation and the nations of the world. So sometimes we don't know what to pray for, right? Yes or no? Sometimes we are lost in words and what to pray for. But you can, you know, when you're reading the scripture passages, so many of them that we are looking are so powerful that you can speak over your um, life and over the ministry and the family and the responsibilities that God has given to you. So we see that throughout the centuries, the church... The church's understanding of the uh, of the spiritual is progressively being restored. Yes or no? We see that you know the early church and onwards, and how the dark ages, how it went bad, but how God restored things. Okay. So what was uh, what seemed to be completely lost during the dark ages, God was progressively restoring that through the reformers and the revivalists, the missionaries. Okay, who proclaimed and also who defended the truth and also who led people to experience, you know, uh, uh, the power of God, the presence of God and the truth of God for their own lives. Okay, so these reformers and revivalists who proclaim and step into experiencing what God desires for them and the church to walk in. So what are some of these truths? These truths are... Uh, you know, um, uh, sorry, just before that, uh, you know, we see that throughout church history, the church has gone through cycles of losing and rediscovering important spiritual truths. Okay. And we see that uh, particularly after the early church period and into the Middle Ages, there has been a progressive uh, restoration and understanding of key spiritual uh, principles. And then we see during the dark ages, you know, the church's connection with biblical truths, you know, misled uh, people, people were lost, 
and um, because of political control, corruption in the church, and uh, you know the blending of Christian teachings with cultural traditions. And then we see how God raises up reformers, revivalists over the centuries to bring back, to reclaim what was lost and guide the church into living in alignment with his will. Okay, So we'll come back after the break and look at uh, the truths, uh, what were the truths that uh, were included and um, which were restored. Okay, we'll come back after the break. Thank you.